Testing. Te- is this thing on? Who's our guest today? Today, our guest is the one, the only, Sick Vic. <laughs> What's up, Sick Vic? Hi. This is Claudia, my wife. We're going to talk about your history and, and kind of what you've been through through your, your life um, and whatnot. So I, I would like to take you back from the beginning and like talk about right from the get-go because nobody knows anything about you from the beginning of the story. I always had a mouthpiece. Unfortunately for me, I didn't know about gangs. I didn't know about problems out here in the West Coast. East Coast is different. West Coast is a whole different world. And, you know, problems problems started happening. I like to fight. I fought a lot. I did get incarcerated uh, in 1995. No, 1996. I caught my first case. My first case was robbery. Um, we won't go into too much detail, but then I got, they sentenced me uh, on my first offense. They sentenced me to three to eight. Wow. It was, uh, two, two and a half years to eight years. And, you know, at 19, I'm looking at straight prison for years. And they're telling me, hey, you're too violent. You're going straight to a medium max. So I wasn't put like in a medium facility, a minimum facility. No, they said, you're going straight to a max. I spent 15 years of my life behind bars uh, in prison, not county jail, none of that. I, didn't, I don't even count the county jail. I just count the 15 years that I did in prison. So you yeah. got two choices. You're going to either be institutionalized or you're going to be somebody who learned their lesson. Uh, unfortunately for me, I got out. I got out after three years. I got out in 1999 and they put me on house arrest because of course I had disciplinary problems that made me a violent person. However, they, they were like, it's just a kid, first offense. Let's just parole his ass, you know what I mean? So I get parole, they put me on the bracelet and I, I just wasn't ready. They don't have rehabilitation programs that are proper. They don't help you get back to society. They don't have like a six month to a year program that helps you get back into the world. Nah, they just, they say, hey, listen, go to school, go get a job. If you don't do shit, you're gonna be in the back in the worst level and you're just gonna fuck up your life. You said in the beginning that your mom and dad like loved you, they were really good parents, but you had a lot of anger inside. Why do you think that is? So maybe, you know, we're hot headed, but you know, Irish, Puerto Rican, that could be a problem. You know what I mean? Um, other, I'll tell you what, my mother, as much as a, of a saint as she is, she has a short fuse when it comes to when she was younger. She's a, she, she will box you up. She wasn't going to take no lip from nobody. And my father was a bomb. His temper was very, you know, he had a rough life. He had a rough life and he had some trauma and they created a loving environment, but also a war zone in my home. And at mm. a young age, at a young age, I was involved in, you know, being inside a war in your own home. And it's just part of, you know, kids having kids. There was something evil inside of me that was born. Um, there was just something dark inside of me. Okay, so so back in the days, in the night, in the early 90s, um, the gangs were really heavy. Okay. And when gangs are really heavy, everybody wanted to be a thug or a gangster. You picked a avenue and you wanted to be the baddest motherfucker. And everybody around me also wanted to be the baddest motherfucker. And when you get that kind of mentality and everybody has that mentality, like, listen, I'm going to kill the most people. I'm going to stab the most people. I'm going to beat up the most people. And that's how you get your name recognized. That was the atmosphere that I grew up with. Everybody's mind was like, let's be the hardest motherfucker. Tupac was young with his new music. Biggie was young with his new music. Everything was an aggressive thug life. You know what I mean? Right. So then once you get past the courts, then you get the anxiety. Most people get some kind of anxiety, butterflies, or some kind of nervous feeling about going to prison. And I won't tell you different. I, you know, I was like, oh shit, what's coming? But I was actually excited. And you've heard, this is the worst place in the worst place. And believe it or not, it was worse than I expected. Wow. Yeah. So most people think that they know some shit on their first rip. You don't know shit. And back then, gangsters were gangsters. 
there was none of this fucking everybody snitching everybody out. What if like, you don't want to be in a gang? <laughs> okay. So so here's the reality of prison, Jason. You cannot be in a gang and you can help yourself up. Here's the problem. Let's say that some asshole decides that you look like a cherry to them. And a cherry meaning, I'm going to take your money. You're going to buy me commissary. I'm going to punk you around. I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want with you. And if you get lippy, I got 500 soldiers that are coming with me. Um, and I'm going to be honest with you. Um, every race has their own way of addressing shit. And every race has different cliques. So, you know, you got your blood, you got your clips, you got your... What's, it, what's the experience the first day? So when I pulled up to prison, I pulled up, they put you in the fish tank. And the fish tank... You said fish tank. So what is that? Like a separation? That's just... the intake. So the fish tank is the intake. And once you get out of the fish tank, you're, you used to come straight to a yard with 15 to 2,000 inmates. The paperwork better be clean. Everything better be in order. And people are going to want to know who the fuck you are. You know what I mean? Okay. So you get on the bus from county, and everybody on that bus is going to prison for the first okay. time or whatever. They're just going to prison. Once you get off the bus, you go into the property and you go to an intake. They do all the paperwork and all that bullshit. And then they throw you in a cell and walk into prison. They give you three squares in a cot, and then boom. Sooner or later, them doors open for showers, for yard, for whatever. So they walk up to you and they just they want to know who you are. Why well, are you in here? As soon as you hit the yard, you are a you are a member of a different society. Welcome to Planet Pluto. If you get tested, you better you better do what you got to do to be respected. And it's shitty, you know what I mean? Because it gets to a point where your life is at risk. As soon as you get off. As soon as you step foot on that yard, your life is at risk. You don't know who's who. You don't know who's coming at you. You don't know if somebody has a knife. You don't know what the fuck is going on. Right. I was I was the perfect example of what a fuck up looks like. I was an angry, aggressive animal that went into prison, and instead of making me a better person, it taught me how to be worse. Oh, because. Because I met more animals like me, and then we were just a bunch of animals together, running in a pack. You know what I mean? And then we could go, whatever, fuck you, let's go to war. And when you got that brave heart mentality, because that's what it pretty much comes down to, you're gonna be on some brave heart shit. There ain't no guns. There's a bunch of yard biscuits, which we call rocks, yard biscuits. Uh, and uh, yeah, because remember, we we're in a desert. So yeah. the whole yard is full of rocks, big ass boulders. And they used to, we used to call those yard biscuits. And yard biscuits are meant there to harm other people. Like in one riot, there was like 300 of us against like 400 of them. And boom, I was getting hit on my back <laughs> from my own team. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it was pretty crazy. I'm like, what the hell? I'm in the middle of a war. I'm getting hit in the back. I'm like, what the fuck is going on, motherfuckers? And I turn around, and it's my own guys that are so far back, scared, throwing rocks from a distance and hitting their own teammates. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah it's pretty crazy. But that's, you know, that's, it, it is what it is. It's pretty crazy in there. Um, people, people can sugarcoat it. But I, I can tell you right now, there's rape victims. There's victims. There's people who get punked and punk punk and bitch are humongous words that you don't need. um nowadays they treat it a little bit more flexible me i've never been able to use those words because i think they're very disrespectful punk to me it's a guy who likes to take it in the ass and you're just a chick for somebody else gotcha. and i don't know about you but that's that don't go for me and right. then, and then a bitch is something you should never call another man. Like, bro, I ain't a female. I ain't, a, I ain't your hoe. And I'm about to rip your fucking teeth out. So, and I'm going to be honest with you. I've watched people's life get taken because of those words.
much in many different spectrums. And if you get called out in prison, not only do you have to fight somebody, you might have to take somebody down through them. And that's not a game. That's not a joke. That's not a, you know, you hear that word, you know something's going down. Like, ooh. So you're, you're, you're in there. I mean, it's a really long time. Yeah. Any, I mean, you must have like, I'll tell you what, missing people. Like what, what was so, the emotions so, like? So while you're in there, here's some things to entertain yourself with. Work it out. That is your primary aggression taker that you can get your fucking anger out of. And be, back then they had weights. But there was yards that didn't have weight. So then you have to do that shit old school. Push-ups, pull-ups, dips, fucking work your ass off and maintain yourself prepared for war. Uh, poker. At really? The age of nine, at the age of 19, I was a poker table breaker. Wow. And all, and all I would do is wake up, eat, go play poker all day long, and win everybody's money. Fucking chess, poker, cards, any cards, spades, pinochle. I mean... I can take your money right now in so many different things. Ping pong, billiard, pool, you know, the gyms, the gyms usually have boxing, they got weights, they got they got a pool table, they got some shit that you can do. So there is recreational shit that you can do. Me being an athlete, I wanted to be in all the sports. So I played softball, I played basketball, I played football, I played everything that they had to offer. It sound, it, I mean, it sounds not that bad. Like from what yeah. you're saying, it sounds like they were well, Very I'll tell you what, once you genius. get to a certain level of you already passed all the dumb shit, then, then it's just doing your time. Boom, boom, boom. Especially when you're in a prison with a bunch of convicts, the fuck-ups are fuck-ups. But that's why they have level ones, level twos, level threes, level fours. You know what I mean? Level mm -hmm. ones are usually for convicts. Workers, motherfuckers, lifers, you know, people who want to have a, a different life in prison. They've already been through all that shit. They don't want to deal with dumb little kids. They don't want to deal with politics. They, don't want to, they just want to do some time and fucking not remember that they're in there for the rest of their life. You know what I mean? Level ones are for all the workers, facilitators like me. I got anger problems up the yin yang, but I was an anger management facilitator. <laughs> what? I was, yeah. I used to teach anger management classes. <laughs> and every time the class would come in and see me there, they would be like, what the fuck? Get the fuck out of here. Really? Knowing that I was a temperamental motherfucker on the yard, everybody, and, and, and I would play it off with a smile and a ha-ha <laughs> and just keep it moving because that's what prison is. You never know who's who and what's what. You know what I mean? I was, I worked in the visiting room and I was always getting visits and I was, you know, I'd go in there, you know, maybe sweep for like five minutes, get out of there, get my paycheck and be done with it. And I was always in visiting. So I worked in the gym. I'm going to be honest with you. I worked in the gym probably like three or four years. I didn't have no occupation. Like I didn't have no, no duties. Like I just signed a paper and I was a gym worker. And it was because the coach was cool as shit. And he loved me being in there competing. At the same time, I was like the number one handball player, obviously not at this weight. Um, but I was one of the, one, if not the best, one of the two top in the system. And, you know, you can go, you can go talk to my homies about it. They'll cry and complain about it, but they'll tell you the truth. You know, I got a homie named Jojo, who I like to rub it in his face. He was my son. I let him win one time. Well, you said gambling. Gambling what exactly? You don't have okay. anything. Are you ready? Are you ready? So here you go. So this is what you gamble in prison. Commissary. Commissary is store. The store has food. It has hygiene, lotion, soaps, deodorants. The state provides you with Bob Barker toothpicks. A toothbrush this big and fucking the state soap will, will literally rip your skin off because it's so horrible. So you have to purchase your own shit like Irish Spring, Dial, Z uh, Z what the fuck are the other ones? Uh, Tone, shit like that with cocoa butter, soap bars that you can actually wash your body with. Also, um, gel deodorant, 
You know what I mean? Lotion, Jurgens lotion. They don't provide it. They, they get $35,000 per inmate. And I can guarantee you, they don't give us more than like 2000 a year per inmate. What, what do they do with the money? Cha-ching! So I'm going to tell you guys the same thing because I want everybody to actually go watch this. There is a show on Netflix called The 13th the 13th, the 13th Amendment. And this, I'm about to publicize this fucking thing because it explains exactly what prisons are. Okay. They are, they are, they are piggy banks. That's what they are. And I'm going to tell you who, who benefits from these piggy banks. Walmart, JCPenney, Victoria's Secret, all these companies are benefiting from free or sweat, sweatshop like working environments that they can minimize their overhead and and they've all been pulled up on and as soon as they've been exposed they ran away from it. like oh we can't do that no more but everybody cries about sweatshops in different countries but it's happening right here in the prisons they pay they paid me one dollar for each for each case of cars that I could pack in in order and tape up. And each case had a hundred decks. So I had to sit there, sort out a whole deck, pack it up, put it in a fucking box, tape it, and then put it in there and do that a hundred times for one dollar. Oh. For one fucking dollar. How is is, that the, is the pricing the same from the, the store as something you'd see oh. now out here? Get ready. Are you ready? The price of everything is double, maybe triple. Thanks. So, so let's say a soup out here costs eight cents for a ramen soup. They're charging you twenty-seven cents a month for a soup. Um, let's say, babe. Sorry, she's getting a phone call. Uh, Carolina. So, so um, let's say a deodorant costs five dollars. It's going to cost you $10 to $11 to get a deal. You know what I mean? And here's what's even more fucked up. If you have restitution from the courts or from your crime, you got um, early fault, or so they kind of leave. What's up, dude? I love you, dude. Your brother's here. Hey, your brother said he loves you. I so, love you um, <laughs> um, so let's say, like me, I got hit with 135000 in restitution. And they said, you have to pay that off. So they take 10% of any money that comes to you from the streets towards the restitution. And you have to pay off a certain amount until they knock it out and then they don't take any more money, right? And it takes quite a while. So by, let's say that you get $100 sent to you and they're taking $10 every time or $20 every time. But, you know what I mean? You got minimal amount that your family probably fucking struggled to send you because life's a motherfucker out here. And then you only got $80 to survive for like a month. Ugh. Wow. And then this, and this is what they serve you. Let's say they give you three pancakes in the morning. Because pancakes is their favorite. It's minimal, it's minimal financial uh, fucking burden. And it's so easy to make batter and just give you pancakes and pancakes. It got to a point where I wouldn't stab anybody who offered me a bank. Like, like I got out here and I saw a fucking IHOP and I was like, don't fuck around. Don't fuck around. Don't take me there. Because, you know, in my mind, I'm like, I don't want to fuck a bank. Don't fucking offer me another fucking bank. I had a friend of mine, I joke all the time, and he was like, fuck, man, the fucking potatoes every fucking day in the fucking county. <laughs> the county jail will give you potatoes. Up to the fucking potatoes are coming out of your fucking eyes. Dude, I like because, potatoes. Because, yeah, but Bobby, think about it. Let's say they give you potatoes. Not for, not for a year straight. I don't want county <laughs> grilled potatoes, though. Yeah. Hey, it's rotten potatoes and fucked up potatoes, but it's oh. just potatoes. You would get fucking sick of potatoes after like five years. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, here's a here's a one that's really fucked up and that I think I'm institutionalized about. Um, I went to Eden Prison. Eden was the max prison here in Nevada. And they have no ice. Nothing comes cold. There's no ice. 
You're not going to get a cold drink with ice. And I was there five and a half years and I could not have a fucking cup of ice. So I told my wife and everybody around me, and you know it, Victor, I don't want to drink without ice. I need fucking ice in my cup because I told myself that once I got out of that bullshit, I would never drink a fucking hot cup or a warm cup or a fucking cool cup of drink. I wanted a frozen cold drink. And to this day, I get mad if my drink ain't cold. Like, babe, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Like, ah, uh, why is my drink not cold? And that's the kind of shit that I'm institutionalizing. Right? I wear my sandals in the shower. And I t- <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> All right, so check this out. In prison, in prison, I didn't go to the showers and shower with my feet bare on the ground. So is that is, is everybody or just you? No, no, no. A lot of convicts don't shower without with their feet on the ground. Because there's so much, you got to remember, there's not just one motherfucker with you. It's a bunch of motherfuckers with you. And some of these motherfuckers do not have proper hygiene. Mm. And some of these motherfuckers don't shower. And some motherfuckers have diseases. And some motherfuckers have fucked up shit going on. And you don't want to touch nothing. You just want to shower, get out, and go to your cell where it's nice and clean, and put your shit on. And I would never use my... I would never let my feet touch anything. And then my organization believes that we should have our shoes on at the crack of fucking dawn all the way to the to dusk. You know what I mean? From dawn to dusk, I need you in your fucking shoes in case anything pops off and you're a fucking soldier ready to represent. So we don't wear sandals like just kidding. You know what I mean? So it got to my head so many years that like I have nice rugs on my floor and I got carpet and I'll, I'll walk in my sandals. I don't walk. I, I will not let my feet touch it. I'm starting to get a little bit better with it where I can feel it. But, like, but, okay, you, know, but you know, you but know, I know. Yeah. Yeah, but you know. It, it's just almost like ingrained at that point. So, so here's what's crazy to me. I, I'm a rational crazy person. And I don't know how to explain that more than that statement. There. Uh, that's, that makes sense. I'm, a, I'm an insane person who has rational thinking at times. And it doesn't make sense because you know I'm crazy, but yet I'm you're toning it down. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a genius over here, but you're insane over here. How is that possible? And, you know, it's like they say, it's a thin line between being a genius and being an insane person. What does a genius possess that the insane lament? Mm. You like that one, right? Look at yeah, that. I like that. That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know who said that? No. Dr. Evil. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> you like that? Look, yeah, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. He said it's that kind of malaise that the genius possess that the insane will make. So I, I wanna I wanna ask, what helps you on the outside tone down your intensity as you know? You know, the intensity could be, you know, others aren't ready for that type of intensity sometimes, especially if they just been living this regular life, you know, what helps so, you tone down your intensity? So I'll tell you it? what, my, the, the, the tool that has helped me the most is seeing my kids' faces. Mm, Your yeah. face, my mother's face, and Sebastian and Kristen's face, the same and angels. Um, it helps me tone down because at that moment I say to myself, they need me. You know what I mean? And at the end of the day, I am on full sacrifice for my children and my family. I am no longer thinking about myself. I carry a load on my shoulders and that load cannot be put down. And that's, you know, as a man, you got to carry it. And when I'm losing control, I try to see your face telling me, hey, dad, I love you. And boom. You know, like it helped me snap at it. Believe it or not, it helped me. It helps me. Like there was a couple of times, and I and I told this to my wife and my mom, and I think I told you. Um, I was facing some serious shit where I knew that I was probably not gonna make it. And no matter what, I had to go. And sometimes you're in a situation where numbers are against you, but you have to do what you gotta do. And at that very moment. I would picture you and my mom's face and you were just a baby. 
and do it by my face and it would alleviate the nervousness and, and say, you know, if this is my time, then I'm going to take those two faces with me through the day. You know what I mean? And that shit, you know, as sad as it sounds, it helped me to, mm. you know, to be strong and say, hey, you know, these are the two faces I want to see when it's my time to go. That's what right. Faces, you know what I mean? You got to find some motivation, dig deep, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, listen, I use that as a tool to survive. I was like, and you were my biggest tool to survive because I was like, I'm never going to abandon my son again. You know what I mean? I felt like I abandoned you when I went to prison. And that's where I was like, I'm not smoking weed. I'm not doing drugs. I'm not drinking. I'm going to be healthy. I want to get on my feet again. I'm going to get the fuck out of here. and I'm going to go take care of myself. Did you find it hard when you got out? Because there's obviously drugs when you get out and it so believe it or not that was the easy part to this day i don't do drugs i don't smoke weed i don't drink alcohol i don't my only vice now is i like tomahawk steak and lobster hey <laughs> i like those i like that too. <laughs> listen i i didn't eat good food for so many years um that i i kind of got lazy and enjoyed the food and i put on oof, Probably what 185 pounds. To wow. that out. Yeah, I ate a whole human being. Skull, head, bones, everything. And believe it or not, as fat as I am, this shit is hard underneath. It makes no sense. I'm like a juggernaut. So <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, listen, that's my only vice that I see at the moment, besides not working out, because I taught my son so much about being healthy, being real. No, no, no fake shit, no creatine, no, no additives, no steroids, no nothing. Be yourself, be the best that you can be without any assistance. Right. Because that'll last longer and make you healthier. You know, you can be fake and look phenomenal. I could go right. get me some good steroids and be fucking swole by next year. But that's not real. Right. Like surgery. I mean, you just go get fucking surgery now. Yeah. Go add muscles to you. Uh, People You're, are doing all these that. these girls getting Brazilian yeah. butt uh, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to Mexico and become an Instagram model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 